Welcome. I am Trustee Stephen Begg of the Ottawa Public Library Board. I'm delighted to be introducing this evening's program. Uh, first, it's important to acknowledge that the land where most of us are gathering this evening is the tr traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Today's event is part of the Ottawa Public Library's ongoing series of celebrations for International Women's Day. We are pleased, uh, delighted to be partnering with the Ottawa International Writers Festival on our second author event this month to feature remarkable feature, uh, female writers. Also this year, in honor of International Women's Day, the library is highlighting the outstanding achievements of several amazing women who have emerged during this pandemic as sheroes. Please see the OPL website for details about the library sheroes panel on March 24th. You also find information on an exciting YA author event with Writers Fest happening tomorrow, also in the spirit of International Women's Day. This evening, we are pleased to welcome Eden Robinson, who will discuss her recent book, Return of the Trickster, part of the brilliant and captivating Trickster trilogy. I find Eden's writing uh, powerful and inspiring, and we hope this evening's conversation will inspire you. Return of the Trickster is available at OPL, and it is my pleasure to hand it over to Sean Wilson, the Artistic Director of the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening. I'm also on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the Writers' Festival's 2021 virtual season. My name is, oh, unable to start video. Well, I'm not on video, but I'm here. Um, uh, my name is Sean. On behalf of the festival and the Ottawa Public Library, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event, which features two of my favorite authors, Karen McBride and Eden Robinson. As always, I want to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, and I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. Our spring season continues into June and it's all available online at writersfestival.org. So all you need to do to connect with some of the world's most acclaimed authors is click play. If you enjoy this event, and I know you will, or any of our virtual programming, please consider making a charitable donation. Your financial support will allow us to continue to bring you the world's most interesting authors and thinkers. Now let's turn it over to our host, Karen McBride. Karen is an Algonquin Anishinaabe writer from Timiskaming First Nation in this territory that some call Quebec. She's an elementary school teacher, the author of Crow Winter, an absolute gem of a novel, one of the best reads of last year, in my not so humble opinion. And if you've not read it, you are missing out. And if you're a fan of the trickster books, I'm guessing Crow Winter will be right up your alley. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to our host, Karen McBride. Hello, okay. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, I'm glad you couldn't see my dorky little face during that time because I was like making all kinds of um, happy noises and faces um, because that was so beautiful. So thank you, Sean. Um, it's amazing to be a part of this wonderful festival. It's one of my favorites um, out of all of them. I mean, I had some, some of the best times with the Auto Writers Festival and that's no different I'm sure tonight where we get to sit down and chat with the incomparable Eden Robinson. And if you don't know her, where have you been? Um, Cause she is amazing, such a, a talented writer and such a great human. Um, I'll just read you her bio quickly. Eden Robinson is the author of a collection of novels written when she was a goth called Trap Lines, which won the Winifred Holtby Prize in the UK. Her next novels, Monkey Beach and Blood Sports, were written before she discovered she was gluten intolerant and tend to be quite grim. The latter being especially gruesome because halfway through writing it, Robinson gave up a two pack a day cigarette habit and the more she suffered, the more her character suffered. Even so, Monkey Beach won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize and was a finalist for the Killer Prize and the Governor General's Award for Fiction. By the time Eden began her Trickster trilogy, however, she had given full reign to her matriarchal tendencies. The first book, Son of a Trickster, became a finalist for the Scotiabank Killer Prize and Canada Read. Trickster Drift, the second book in the trilogy, won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. In 2017, Eden was awarded the Writer's Trust Fellowship. She lives in Keatmont Village in BC. And um, Return of the Trickster, which we get to talk about tonight, is her most recent novel. So if you could join me in virtually welcoming the wonderful Eden Robinson. As I said before, <laughs> it's lovely to meet you. 
Uh, I know, it's so great to meet you. Oh, uh, you know, uh, when I was reading Crow Winter, like the moment where the dad starts singing Starman, uh, yeah, I just burst into tears and had to put the book down for a few months. <laughs> 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 it was so beautiful and heartbreaking. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, thank you for that. When I actually wrote that, that was um, a additional scene. And I remember I was talking to Ganya Tio Horn, who did the audible version of my book and Return of the Trickster. So she's yes. great. And she's yes. um, ended up having to sing that part. And I yes. remember I was texting her and I was like, I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to sing. <laughs> Like, yep, yep, we do we have to do it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I'm sure she's probably pretty happy she didn't have to sing too much for yours. So. <laughs> well, she was, uh, she was, she was texting me about some of the, the high slip pronunciations. And then she came to uh, Cthulhu. <laughs> She was wondering what kind of Heisler character that was. Like, no, no, that's a nerd character. You know this guy? <laughs> okay. Every self-respecting goth nerd uh, <laughs> went through a Lovecraft phase. <laughs> Absolutely. The gods at the end of the universe? Come on, yes. that's so, so goth. It's so hard <laughs> Yeah, he was. That was highly influential in the creation of Bob. Oh yes, Bob, <laughs> and I love the name Bob. He. Oh yeah, I. I don't know if we should just jump right into to hanging out with Bob, but he was such a <laughs> um, a great addition. Like it really. Um, I didn't ask any questions. As soon as he showed up, I was like, "This makes sense. I love this guy." <laughs> and then Jared being like, "I need to." give this guy a name because just thinking like this octopus tentacle creature isn't going to work and then uh just what a great brilliant way to showcase both his personality but then the trickster personality being like bob <laughs> <laughs> it's just well, so good the most popular addition to the, the sort of the trickster pantheon has been chuck um, I've had a lot of requests to uh, Chuck is what other people call Sasquatches or Bigfoot, but the highs they call him Begos, or, uh, Big Wuss, Begos. <laughs> 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 and he's like, uh, on the, he's uh, prevalent in all the stories up and down the coast. Uh, in the, when you go into the interior, uh, he's he's a quite a, a, a mean guy and very into eating people. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> <laughs> and on uh, where I am, he was just he re they really like blondes. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were visiting his territory, you'd have to. Like, be careful not to be out by yourself or you'd be kidnapped. Um, but uh, they like bivalves and blondes. All right, so. <laughs> to, to, to know, right? <laughs> Check your hair color. We're a two. <laughs> uh, but Chuck in the story, he's very much not this scary guy he no no i loved him could you talk a little bit about um how he wandered into the story and then how you brought him to life well uh back when i wrote son of a trickster um uh, uh dad was still with us and he read it and he said i like it but you know there there aren't any um there aren't any wild people of the woods in it and that's just you know one of his favorite his favorite characters he loves telling stories about the wild people of the woods and he was like you know that's okay it's got tri but it's, you've got tricksters right there <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have put in a couple of sasquatches so that's he such was, a parent thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> like it's good but 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, so by the time uh, I had, you know, Trickster, the son of a trickster came out, I had already finished Trickster Drift. So it was too late to put it. So Chuck is a completely gratuitous addition to the third book. Strictly there because dad wanted Sasquatches. <laughs> Well, I think you did him very proud. I'm sure he was so stoked. And then just to see um, how well Chuck fit in, you know, like he, it, I, again, it's just like when Bob didn't question it, not once. And then <laughs> was, was sad that he wasn't in there more. And then he showed up at the end. And I was like, Chuck. And a Hugin, that's so funny. <laughs> like, I think I put the book down to laugh. Like, it was so wonderful. <laughs> Well, he was, he, um, uh, I think I had to make it clear that he, he was assimilated into human culture, but he didn't do the thing that, you know, some other wild men of the woods did and, you know, sneakily eat people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was off the sauce, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so, so he has a history with the trickster in my book. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, they, they've, they've fallen in with each other, they're old friends, uh, and when we get met Jared's grandmother, Anita, uh, they were the fighty res couple. <laughs> of I knew them right away. It was like, every res, I'm sure every new person reading was like, I know this couple. <laughs> So they, so they, uh, so whenever uh, we get and Anita got into a fight, he'd go stay with Chuck. So that was his, you know, rebound couch. <laughs> That's where he surfed. Yeah, I could yeah. see it. You can feel that with their relationship right away. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Good. So the biggest request for a spinoff books has been, could you write about Chuck and Megan in the 70s? <laughs> can you? <laughs> I, I need that. I need that book. <laughs> be so great. Be like an accompanying soundtrack to you. Oh my goodness, the playlist would be like out of this world. <laughs> it's like, I, that's a lot of mushrooms and acid. <laughs> oh, no, no question. <laughs> I think I would be going back to the plot, what plot story. <laughs> I just titled the chapters by which breakup that is. <laughs> That's really good though. That could work. I can see it. I support this. <laughs> you need my support, but it's <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah, no, they um uh like when we were uh dad and I went to Vancouver Island and he loves big trees. Like he just it's just one of the so we went to this place called cathedral grove near port alberni mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it was some of like just, the trees were just huge and there was this big stump like it was about as about eight feet high and he said yeah that's that's a bogus that's hiding like the, that's how they would hide from people they would turn themselves into stumps and that stuck with me as one of those details that was eventually going to make it into a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the little note that's like, oh, okay, save that okay. for later. Good detail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I can finally, so spoiler alert. <laughs> I know we should have started with that. Oh, oh yeah. Guys. Spoilers <laughs> all around. <laughs> I, I am the worst spoiler. Like, um, uh, when I was watching Game of Thrones with my cousins, uh, if they hadn't gotten to an episode that I had watched, they would block me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and then unblock me once they'd watched it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Terry Gallagos! Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, 202! Yeah, I set, uh, uh, when Jerry goes to Vancouver in Trickster Draft, uh, I set Aunt Maeve's apartment in Terry Gallagher's apartment on 1640 Grave Lake because I kept her with her a lot. So I knew it very well. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Oh. Amazing. So are there other places? With, well, we know that Vancouver and Kitimat are real places. Yeah. So how did you um, blend fictionalizing them and then also keeping them like in their real? How, what was that process like for you? Uh, well, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to have a book set in Kitimat. It, this was going to be like a Vancouver book. Uh, my mom's family is Altsuk and I grand and great aunt Violet followed the Canterbury work down in the seventies. Um, so, you know, they stayed in like, uh, like when they first got here, they stayed in hotels like the American and they have all these stories and, uh, my aunties were in the, like the red car movement and, uh, so, you know, there's like a rich texture to, uh, their, their Vancouver stories and we would Greyhound down every summer from Kitimat so it was a 22 hour bus ride <laughs> <Brutal. laughs> <laughs> it was a milk run so it stopped at every all the little <laughs> cows I, I've been on the, the Ottawa to home milk run and oh 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 and you know you just wanted to avoid the seats near the bathroom <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so um so I knew that uh, that's actually where I started the series like uh in my head it was the story started with Jared arriving in Vancouver on a Greyhound bus um and the places that I know in Vancouver really well are the places that I lived and the places that my mom's family lived uh because it went I, I found it hard to live in East Vancouver because um you know, I had my grand, my great aunt, a couple of aunts, a couple of uncles, and about 40 cousins. So you can't really date privately. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Just like a little red, the little red microcosm. Yes. <laughs> it's very East Vancouver. Uh, like there is nowhere that I can go where someone isn't related to me. I get it. I yeah, totally get it. yeah. So that's that's the experience I wanted Jared to have. Um, so when I set like the Vancouver scene, it was uh, like I knew all the alleys and all the, and it was just wonderful to be able to kind of hold it in my head. Um, and for the third book, I thought they were going to be, you know, uh, moving away from uh, Vancouver a bit, but it never got past like Abbotsford. So. Um, and you know it's it's just a just places that I know really well you know I know the sights I know the sounds there's a little gentrifying going on right now in East Vancouver but uh -huh. um but it's still got that kind of uh, uh that vibe that working class vibe that uh that worked really well in the story and it, it's also kind of uh just kind of wonderful uh I'm you know, it's, it's where I spent every summer growing up. <laughs> uh, and I remember, God, I had a very brief job uh, picking strawberries. And uh, yeah, I had to take, take a bus out to the farm. Oh my God, that was a long ride. But, and I wasn't suited to picking strawberries at all. I get like a careful little basket and uh, you know, other people would have buckets. <laughs> totally get that yeah uh, they don't like fire it. they don't fire a lot of people but they let me go after a week <laughs> <laughs> your berry skills are just not up to par no <laughs> my aunties my aunties had the same complaint like when they would uh take me berry picking of like yeah you daydreamed a lot so you know you'd be wandering around and you know you'd very carefully and tenderly pick each berry and then you'd eat one and then you'd look up of at course. the sky yeah <laughs> it's like you know you have a perfect little bucket and everyone else had like you know totes <laughs> i don't think i've ever seen a full container of berries when i've gone berry picking i've always had my little margarine you know of course <laughs> container never full i just always saw the bottom so i, I can relate <laughs> always just like <laughs> 
Yeah, we've got we've got blueberries and huckleberries on the point. And you know, that's where we used to run and pick for when we got hungry after swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I fondly remember them, but I was never really good at it. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. dad, dad, poor dad, he had an amazing sense of direction. And he couldn't understand how I couldn't understand which way I was facing. <laughs> No, you're looking north. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> do you just feel it? How do you? <laughs> oh, well, he was a trapper and a fisherman and mm -hmm. a, a logger. So, you know, he loved being outside. And he got three kids that were house cats. So, <laughs> like, my brother's really into computers. I'm a writer. And my sister's in TV and film. So... <laughs> You're all inside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd still drag us to the channel, like on the weekends. And at that time, I didn't really appreciate it. But now it's like, oh, you know, now, now they're my fondest memories. Mm -hmm. and you can write about them and yes. stretch your skills and be like, look, dad, it was, was not all for naught. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think there's hope that my nephew might be outdoorsy, but uh, my niece loves to hike. But yeah, I'm, yeah, it's like, oh, look at tree. <laughs> <laughs> In my backyard. That's, that's what I need, right? <laughs> just going to look at it through the window. Exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. I feel that I'm the same. I mean, I, right, but then I'm also like, a huge dork so all I'm doing is watching tv and playing video games um <laughs> like me and crash pad would probably have been pretty good friends like anytime Jared was like yeah whatever I don't really want to watch oh or me and Dent especially um would have had great times watching Doctor Who um but the something I found really interesting about Jared is that he seems to like really push away the supernatural even in the media that he consumes <laughs> and he's even like no I don't want to watch that sci-fi stuff like a weirdo. Um, he's a he's an intensely practical soul. Absolutely, like he, he, who has no choice. No, no, he really he's really the last person who should be a trickster. But <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was gonna go to a, like a fourth book, but I think Jared was pretty well done by then. He just. He's like, yeah, he no, was like, no more, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you know, a lot happened in the third book. <laughs> I think I'm finally getting plot. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was always more focused on like the, you know, the character's world and mm -hmm. uh, just exploring what, you know, the different way they bounced off each other and then mm -hmm. the third book it's like oh it's, it's consequences you do something and something happens yeah and that... <laughs> apparently <laughs> i was like oh okay oh that makes sense and um yeah so, uh, so for this one uh there are moments when uh like for, for all the books that I've written up to this point, uh, I've been in a singular viewpoint, like either first person or third person limited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is my first baby step into multiple narrators. It's, um, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I can yeah, see why I mean, people do it. And you killed it. It was so good. Every single oh, one, I was absolutely believing it and was so excited. Um, to get into their viewpoint and I love and using second person oh, that's so scary. <laughs> well I think poor and rune second person <laughs> I get it <laughs> like you know it's it's used for recipes and instructions <laughs> porn uh, <laughs> so and it's really hard to like i i remember playing with it in blood sports uh and it's hard to 
yeah, it, it's a really st strange viewpoint, but it, it worked in little chunks. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to trying to do them all in third person and it, it, it wasn't distinct enough. Uh, in the, mm -hmm. um, so we, we played with the, we played with the tenses, we played with, uh, and then it, it once it hit uh, present second person, it just snapped into place. And mm -hmm. all the characters' voices, like they were, they were already there. So mm -hmm. it was just refining and, and moving some things aside. I was really excited. It was, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I could write a, a whole novel from Maggie's point of view. <laughs> that would, <laughs> that I would don't be know what to think, yeah. Yeah, that would be a really intense book. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but she was a lot, like her voice, like once it came through, it was distinctive and, you know, there were ways mm -hmm. that she would say things. Yeah, that just are natural and just distinctly Maggie, like no matter yeah. what you know. Yeah. where she is who she is and <laughs> what she's gonna say to you <laughs> I, and yeah I was like oh this is why people do multiple narrators because you can you can play the um you know their experiences off each other and someone can mm -hmm. know something and the other person can know something and they don't know the same thing but the reader does mm -hmm. so it, it's that it's a wonderful dynamic Mm -hmm, definitely and I think it made so much sense for it to really come to light in in the final book um, as we're getting to see Jared accept who he is and what he yes. can do even if he's not doing it well he's trying <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but it made sense that all of a sudden we can get more and yes. yeah it was just fantastic I mean, yeah. I can gush like the entire time about how Aww. good this is. <laughs> well, he's definitely going to be a peacemaker. And I think that will annoy a lot of people because, you know, <laughs> that's what he does. <laughs> right, yeah. And I think there's something so human about how he um, re, um, how he interacts as his trickster self or as with other characters. Um, and it's this human this humanity humanity that seems to really um define him as a trickster mm. and really separate him from we um, yes yeah and they just completely drive each other nuts which i think is a common father-son reaction <laughs> yeah yeah the way jared approaches the world and the way we get approach the world like they're um they're opposite, but they're also, you know, uh, we get feels a lot, but he tries to hide it. And Jared just doesn't hide anything. <laughs> but but the baby memory that came out, um, that was a surprise. Like I was, I just needed like a little scene to show that we get had known him for, uh, we get had known Jared since he was a baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was writing it, you know, they started interacting. And uh, most of my other novels have been evening novels. And mm -hmm. some of the Trickster series was all morning novels. And I think, um, you know, the first, the first one was, I wrote between 4am and 5am every morning for a year. And the second one, I took a break and wrote from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. So that seems to be about the magic hour when I have a lot of energy, but my inner editor isn't awake yet. <laughs> 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 so I don't have that persistent voice in the back of my head saying, oh, that's ridiculous. You, no one's gonna believe that. You know, 8 a.m. Right. seems to be the sweet spot. Right, so you don't have that um, second guessing. and Yes. Um, judging yourself uh yes <laughs> it can be really hard i think as as a writer um at every single stage to to sort of believe in your craft um yeah. and uh find that confident little zone where you can just let it flow um i heard that you started writing getting into writing because you kind of wrote a little bit of fan fiction <laughs> i did <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I came from a family of readers, so there were always books around, there were always articles, there were always magazines. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I didn't really, but I was hell bent on being an astronaut. So, uh. <laughs> I mean, same, I feel like we have so much to talk about. <laughs> but then I found out you had to be five, three to go up in the, in the Soyuz capsules. And, you know, I just wasn't, so I was heartbroken all through grade 10. And then in uh, watching a lot of horror, uh, I was going through a Stephen King and Cronenberg phase. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite Cronenberg movie was Scanners. Uh, and I wrote a fan fiction for an English class that the teacher read out to the students and they really liked it. And, you know, up to that point, I'd been in the math club uh, the astronomy club, <laughs> the chess club, <laughs> but, and no one had ever considered me cool before. So like it was full of uh, uh, teenagers who can explode your head with their thoughts. And it was just, it was a lot of exploding heads. So, um, so that's the, so my first short, very first short stories were <laughs> exploding head stories. <laughs> Hey, and then it carries over and paid off because Mandy pulled this off too, right? So I think you paid homage to that, your origin story. I'll sell it as an homage. Yes. <laughs> it was, yeah, so that, so I started writing uh, essays uh, in an essay class that was a university prep course and short stories in my English class. And the two sort of combined. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a lot of short stories, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can totally relate because I started writing because I was writing fan fiction too. Um, so it was so exciting to hear that that's how you really pushed yourself into or fell into it as well. Um, because people tend to dismiss fan fiction, but I think it can really, you know, it's like a little mentorship. It really is. It really is. Mm -hmm. And when you're passionate about something, like, you know, if there are people watching this who really love Chuck and Winkit, I highly encourage you to write fan fiction. <laughs> and link me. I want to read it too. <laughs> Because, you know, like the first novels can be uh, overwhelming. Like when, when you say, yeah, I'm going to write a novel. I remember mm -hmm. when I was writing Lucky Beach, like I, you know, it was such a steep learning curve. There was, there was just, you know, there were so many working parts to the engine that mm -hmm. it was, you know, if you tugged on one, it affected all these other ones. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I remember not really understanding what my editors were talking about with structure. So I just pulled apart one of my friend's books that was similar to mine and stole her structure. <laughs> <laughs> and, Amazing. <laughs> and now that I have a better handle on um, uh, like the way a novel should move, uh, mm. I just like back and I can go, yeah. <laughs> It's like, you know, that moment before you can understand fractions. Like, right. Yeah, I, re I vividly remember when I got it. I was the last person in class to understand uh, how you worked with fractions. And I got it in the middle of my test. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> like, not ideal, but still, kind of, at least now. <laughs> but I couldn't say anything. Otherwise, I'd have to admit that I'd been, you know, cheating <laughs> <laughs> but once I got it it was it was it was just like it was like a brain burst and then I could make all these different connections so that's the same thing that happened to me with um structuring a novel and then mm -hmm. I think the next uh blood sports was like where I finally learned how to tackle like a lot of the elements that I've been playing with, like I, I finally got them. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was just an explosion, like a, of, um, so I think with the Trickster trilogy, just the sheer mass of information has made me 
uh, respect writers who do series. <laughs> I have no idea how they do it. It was a lot. It was a lot of post-its everywhere. It was a lot of, like, um, it was a lot of trying to remember all the different elements. And, and then in, you know, in the final novel, having to let go of a lot of subplots. And, right. you know, that was really hard. But uh, once I could see, like, the narrative drive and how the subplots didn't work to move it forward, um you know I was killing my darlings <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I spent so much time on these all these subplots and uh they they were good stories but they didn't go anywhere mm -hmm. and they didn't reveal anything new and it was like oh I get that now <laughs> <laughs> like oh this is why we edit oh <laughs> Oh, 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 now I see what my editors have been trying to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I will begrudgingly admit it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so there was, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, there was, there was a lot of movement in the skill level. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been working with multiple narrators uh, because I've, because before, I started writing the trickster series. I was writing a trashy band council romance. Uh, and that, <laughs> <laughs> and what was bogging me down was that I didn't I didn't have the skill yet to handle multiple narrators. So it just exploded everywhere. Like the the first the two mains that are having the affair uh, are the environmental manager who used to work for the AFN became disillusioned with the politics, decided to move home to help his community. Uh, uh, but his wife didn't want to leave Ottawa. So she, uh, they separated and then divorced. Uh, she's dating a guy on the Ottawa, one of the Ottawa Senator farm teams and his kids love hockey. So they've, they've kind of accepted him as their dad. Um, and they're, uh, you know, a little starstruck. Uh, so he's, the environmental manager has been carrying a torch for the housing manager since high school. She's married to the chief operating, the chief operating officer, and his brother is the chief counselor. So, so we're starting off in an election year. <laughs> So the environmental manager's brother uh, has a gambling addiction. <laughs> <laughs> and the housing manager's brother is living with their parents and has started to grow up in their basement. Um, so there's, there's a lot of scenes where, um, you know, it's like trying to, trying to manage the different uh, all the different characters from one point of view, like I normally mm -hmm. do, was not working. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't right. working. So, uh, but the second I unleashed multiple narrators, uh, like, you know, the, the grants coming in and, you know, second cousin who saw the coup park in the driveway of the housing manager's cousin. <laughs> Coming back from Tim Hortons, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stayed all night. Yeah. <laughs> Took pictures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're Samsung. <laughs> so the book, the book opens with uh, the housing manager has suspected one of the counselors of stealing her lunch. Um, so she's been putting in bait lunches to the, to the workroom fridge. And uh, on, that, on that day of the big housing meeting, uh, she steals one of her daughter's pot brownies <laughs> and puts it in the bait lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just expecting her to be like really stoned, mm -hmm. um, but she, she uh, falls to the ground. She's throwing up, she's sweating. So one of the, uh, the young man is training to be a paramedic and he's so excited because he has a naloxone kit. 
It's like, this is my moment. <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> It just, you know, it just kind of exploded from there. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I was so frustrated trying to um, trying to wrangle all the characters. So I've been reading a lot of novels where there's multiple narrators, like uh, There There Has 12, The Break Has 11, Five Oblivions Has Five. So mm -hmm. just, just watching, like, the ch uh, taking it apart. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm just not a tidy writer, so when I take things apart, I literally take them apart. So I photocopy the entire book, and then break it down into chapters, mm -hmm. and then into scenes, and then spread it all out over the apartment, <laughs> <laughs> and then just follow the you know follow the threads. And follow the thread. Which, yep. Yeah, which techniques they're using? Like, how do they manage? so many different narrators like sometimes they don't change like some writers don't change the voice they just they mm -hmm. just make it clear through what they're thinking who it is mm -hmm. and other writers change the voice entirely so that each voice is distinctive and mm -hmm. sometimes they have like a tentpole event that structures the book uh like the break has the event at the break mm -hmm. but because it's so horrific she does this amazing thing where each character gives you just a little bit more. And then you mm -hmm. see the next character gives you just a little bit more. Um, so you don't get the whole event all at once. So it would be an intense and overwhelming scene if she did it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, <laughs> it creates, it created this like amazing tension throughout the book and uh, there, there again. They did. He did like a, a tentpole construction, where it was, um, you know, they're all going to end up in this power when someone has a gun, mm -hmm. and you know, even though like some of the scenes may be slow, you're. So, I was going. Well, how would that work for a trashy Ben Council <laughs> <laughs> And some of those techniques are what I used in Return of the Trickster, but mm -hmm. oh, oh. Oh my goodness. Okay, we went really fast. Yeah, um, there is a QA and a um, question we have here from Facebook. I should mention too, to all of the listeners who are tuned in, watching all these things, that there is a Q&A section. So please, if you have questions, type them in. And we'll try to get to them if we don't go too off course because <laughs> <laughs> it just happens that way. <laughs> Um, I didn't even get to my clam puppets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, okay, so we are, we're getting actual questions though. Woohoo. All right, okay. let's see. Um, we have one from Alyssa Curry on Facebook. She said, big fan, Eden just finished reading Aww. the book last night and loved it. Are there Thank any you. characters from this trilogy that you see yourself revisiting in future works? Um, well, you know, there was, I cut a lot from, from Hank and Nika, like they, they had a whole thing going on with Sarah, where when Jared went missing, they were, they were looking for him. And like, there's like a scene in the booze can I'd really like to explore. <laughs> <laughs> and again, like the, there have been a lot of requests for Chuck. Chuck needs to live somewhere. Chuck needs mm -hmm. to have his own book or something. Um, uh, right now, um, yeah, it, it's it, yeah. I'm just gonna take a break and deal with some health issues that I've been putting off. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the fifties. <laughs> and in a pandemic, like come on, we can. I think you you've earned your break. <laughs> Oh my God, I just want to travel. It's, you know, I want to, I want to go to Vancouver Island and see like a bunch of family and mm -hmm. go to Vancouver and uh, like my sister lives in Brantford. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like, um, have you found that the being in like such a, a small space or confined space has 
um, changed how you write or how you approach writing? Uh, when I was when I was writing Return of the Trickster, um, nothing bothered me. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, pandemic, yeah, yeah. Groceries once a <laughs> week, yeah, 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 that's fine. Um, but now that I don't have a book, it's a lot of time. <laughs> So I've, I've discovered podcasts and mm -hmm. uh, audiobooks. So uh, it, it's wonderful to be able to, to do like the chores that I don't like doing because my mind is engaged in the story that's yeah. being told to me. So mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes like things like cleaning behind the stove bearable. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so like, uh, I'm at the place where everybody was at the beginning of the pandemic, like I'm, I'm a complete introvert. So it didn't bother mm -hmm. me at all to be by myself for many, many days. Mm -hmm. uh, but a year into the pandemic, <laughs> I'm starting to feel it now. <laughs> and, and my family and friends are all over it. And they've moved on to the next stage. But I'm like, eh. <laughs> Like, wait, I, I'm behind. <laughs> well, that, they're mocking me for how smug I used to be. <laughs> oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Rude. How rude. <laughs> As cousins do. Of course. Of course, that's how they show you their love. If you're not being made fun of, does your family love you? I, they, they, this is a question that will never be answered. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, your earrings are amazing. Oh, thank you. They're from Etsy, uh, from Kay Francis Deedberg. Shout out. She's fantastic. Nice. I know. And they're really light, which is really <gasps> cool. You know, they're not super heavy. So I highly recommend. Um, oh, they're she's just great. gorgeous. I, I love earrings and I've had to, yeah, it, it's, it's one of the best things about like Facebook. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. Like the indigenous marketplace is yes. so good. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the cedar weaving and the traditional beading and the, mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, it's like all the reds bling. <laughs> oh my goodness. I know. Like I have to slow myself down because yes. I, I'm going to have a ridiculous amount of things. And I mean, yes. in the pandemic, shopping has brought me joy. So <laughs> I have so much more stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I don't actually have like a lot of physical talents. Like I can't bead, I can't make drums, like all my weaving turns into coasters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely, you know, uh, I, I, I know, you know, uh, once you know how much love and work goes into something, it, it's hard mm -hmm. not to just, you know, stare in amazement. Yeah, and like scoop it all up. Yeah, clam puppets. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I was trying to pitch a children's book to the highest language authority before it was known as the highest language authority. It was, I forgot what it was. Uh, but uh, at the, in the beginning of the world was on fire and all the animals were trying to put out the fire um, and they were being really showy about it <laughs> and nothing was working. So the chief of the clam clans got all his people together and then he got all the other clams in the world together and you know they had a long conversation about what they should do and they all spat at the same time and put the fire out <laughs> <laughs> so I've always wanted to write a libretto <laughs> actual clamshells for the face with googly eyes and a, a, a gray wool sock and like little blankets uh, and they were singing <laughs> <laughs> and Alice the, in Wonderland yeah. and like <laughs> so the reaction was like wow <laughs> wow um we like your idea about the highest of astronomers. 
like, but they're clams. They got the clams. Like a little. I can see. Oops. Oops. <laughs> no, quite Eden. <laughs> good i'm sure there's some composers out there who would like join in i mean i have a degree in music i'll help (laughs) (laughs) absolutely oh yeah no um yeah uh uh, they really do like the well dab loved the 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 duhotla the highest astronomers um so so right now i'm just um transcribing so uh, mm-hmm. Uncle Gordon was talking to my cousin Bet in one of the uh, traditional youth studies. And, you know, he goes on for about four, like um, a solid four tapes. So it, it's, wow. weird, it's weird listening to his voice mm-hmm. and her voice. And, uh, um, and then I have the notes and the pictures that dad gave me. And like there's a, a calendar stone that used to be down the beach that was carved mm-hmm. with uh, petroglyphs. Mm-hmm. Uh, are petroglyphs the ones that are carved? Yeah, there's there's one that's anybody carved. in the QA can answer this. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's one that's carved and there's one that's painted. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were uh, they were carved mm-hmm. and there's mm-hmm. six mountains that form the Heisla calendar. So mm-hmm. uh, um December 21st it starts on this mountain and it mm-hmm. used to have a tree right here and a shaman's cave underneath and when it touched there that was the um you know if it came down on one side of the tree it was going to be a warm spring came down the other it was going to be miserable if on the tree it was going to be normal mm-hmm. so each of the six mountains had different points uh, and on the carved rock, there was a, a sun and each of the rays pointed to one of those points. Wow. So the clans, the different clans had their own duhala, Um And they would gather at the calendar rock at significant times and argue about what it meant and where it was. <laughs> um, my great grandfather, who built the supply store, built it near the calendar rock. So when the wind, because he was a duhala. So in the winter, the Duke Hall, I wouldn't have to go outside. <laughs> he built a window in the back. So they, so my dad remembers them arguing about mm-hmm. uh, what it meant. So because of the pandemic, like I, I can't talk to the, the people who still are Duke Hall, uh, mm-hmm. cause they're all elders. Um, mm-hmm. So, so it's, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. We're just going to transcribe and rough something out and then, then do some interviews. Mm-hmm. There's so many ways that we, I'm seeing a lot of our uh, relations across uh, the country sort of like innovating and bringing that um, connection, even though we can't be in person. So I think mm, yes. um, that in- innovation is so important. And, and I'm glad you mentioned like being able to at least listen and transcribe um, yes. and keep that connection going in spite of the barriers that we have to, to face. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, our council just got like a bunch of elders some iPads. So, you know, my mom, it's the first time she's been FaceTiming. And uh, I didn't realize how lonely she was until we started Facebook, uh, FaceTiming the aunties. And uh, yeah, so now she's a big fan of iPads. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Amazing. Yay. laughs> oh. Good for her for learning the technology. Too, not, like, it's not easy for our, our elders. No. Uh, well, mm-hmm. you know, I had to um, I had to set up like some Apple things. And I haven't used like Apple products in years. So it was like, oh, oh, this is very different. <laughs> <laughs> things have changed. Oh, my <laughs> well, for what my teenage consultants for the Trickster series, um, were just disgusted that Jared was on Facebook. Uh, and <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I was trying to explain it was 2014 and we were all 
on Facebook back then. Exactly. That, yeah. that was and that, to be. You know, they're going, no, nope, no, nope, that, you know, that signals like, you know, kind of, you know, uh, kiss ass, uh, you know, mm -hmm. no one cool is on Facebook anymore. <laughs> uh, so they were trying to explain Snapchat to me. And I felt very much the way mom feels about her iPad. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> why are you filming us there's no one there <laughs> what's the is point that, who are you talking to <laughs> is that us oh my god that's so invasive is that all your friends that's so invasive like <laughs> that's like stalking <laughs> right. i was like okay we're not including snapchat in any of us i don't understand it <laughs> we'll just have we'll just have people mock him for being uncool <laughs> There you go. I think that's fine. <laughs> oh, um, I finally saw getting, the. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I finally saw the Q and A button. <laughs> I know it's like hidden down there, right? But we do have some answers. People came up, came okay. in and told us pictographs are painted. So there you go. Thank you for that. Oh, nice. Uh huh. Nice. So it is um, petroglyphs that are carved. I always get those yeah. confused and like when it's stalagmites. Stalactite and stalag or whatever. Yes. Yes. I always get those Same. ones confused. It's like, not that I write a lot of cave stories, but. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was reading about uh, magnetars. <laughs> and trying to explain to mom that they, you know, what kind of neutron star they were. And she was like, how is this useful in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> I totally get it. I'm that person in my family. Like I just read about black holes recently oh, and was trying nice. to talk about them. Yeah, the nice. it's called Death or Black Hole Survival Guide by Jan 11. Super great. There's also beautiful illustrations to recommend. Oh, um, I just saw that in Misty River Books. Yeah, and it's really cute too. It's like this big. It's tiny um, and it's got matte yeah. black and then a shiny black. Shiny? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we need a whole other hour to talk about there, all our stars. There, I, was, I follow like Andrew and Andrew Petrov uh, and uh, uh, what the math <laughs> and Dr. Becky. <laughs> And, you know, he was describing like the, the black hole swarms and globular clusters. And I was, I try, who, who, you know, it, it's just, you know, we're in a golden age of like astronomical mm -hmm. information. It's just mm -hmm. like every single day there's something new. Oh yeah, so cool. Um, and that does make its way into the curriculum, yeah. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> here we go, I'm circling back. <laughs> And this is why I don't oral story tell. <laughs> oh yeah, I read this thing about meringue. <laughs> what does that have to do with the story? Nothing, I just remembered it right now. Yeah. So I'm gonna tell you about meringue for the next 10 minutes and then I'll get back to the story. <laughs> oh, which somewhat today. Uh, justice. Like one of the characters named Justice had mm -hmm. a very, um, you know, a very lovely subplot with her grandfather, and it didn't do anything for the narrative to thrive, and it was it required so much explanation that it, it just it couldn't stay. Uh, I was mm -hmm. really sad about that because like um, the only thing that survived was the firefly in the room divider. <laughs> like backstories it's like okay you know it, it's not mm -hmm. necessary for the plot so meh mm -hmm. sad to lose it but still at least you got yeah. to experience it yeah. <laughs> here's my moral of the story <laughs> I'm, I'm trying <laughs> <laughs> it lives somewhere <laughs> mm. um so we are at 8 30 but i'd like okay. to finish with a few little rapid fire questions for you okay. um so if you had to pick a favorite of the three in the trilogy, what was your favorite to write? Hmm. Um, 
the, I wrote the first and second one at the same time, actually. Because mm -hmm. uh, just because just I didn't realize I was writing two books. So it was so wild. And uh, I didn't actually expect anyone to read it. <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on you. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone did. <laughs> like there was no pressure whatsoever. It was... Mm -hmm. And it was so early in the morning. It was it was such a giddy experience. Wow, that's great. So um, that's my other one I really wanted to know. So who from the books would you want to spend the day with and what would you do? Oh, Chuck, of course. <laughs> <That's really good. laughs> um, yeah, I just like to hear what, you know, all the things that he wants to say, like, you know, he's 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 got so much backstory on mm -hmm. you know, all the supernatural characters around. I would just love to sit there and gossip. Right, absolutely. <laughs> um, and why does Jared like Nickelback? <laughs> <laughs> he, Jared loves Nickelback. Um, because they speak to him. <laughs> it's one of the play. It's one of the one of the bands he goes to, and he breaks up with someone. And right. so, so it's his breakup band. It's, it's yeah. kind of like, um, yeah, yeah. Well, he he's relentlessly mocked for it. <laughs> he's back. okay with that right he's like okay he, with he that. Isn't yeah, he's, it. he's not bothered by it so it's mm -hmm. like, yeah you love what you love <laughs> <laughs> unabashedly and good for him <laughs> uh, but i didn't expect them to come back in the second book <laughs> Yeah, they stuck, they hung on. They hung on. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, great. I they mean, got a mention sense. and they got a mention in the third, but baby shark yep. came through strong. For the longest time I was singing <laughs> 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 like, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, that's my new go-to. <laughs> Bad musicals with Eden Robinson. <laughs> this one, then the clams. I mean, I'm all for it. Go for it. Oh, well, when I was, oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> well, when I was first learning Heisla, um, I, I have trouble remembering different languages. So mm -hmm. I would sing them. And me and dad used to, every Sunday, we'd go to the Harrison, uh, to the Mount Leighton Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And they're outside and in the winter they'd steam. So I'd be bouncing around the pool singing high slow words. <laughs> it's a great technique, I think. As an educator, I can speak to the, the truth in that. So you were innovating. I, yeah, I remember all those mm -hmm. words. Uh, Dad would be just sort of going, Yeah, look at the swallows. La la la. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh there she goes again. <laughs> I think all of that means you got to write that opera. Right? Yeah, everything's yeah. coming together. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> the, oh, it's snowing here even harder. Like, I'm just looking at it going, yeah, okay. We're doing yeah. that. <laughs> I'm going to bake some cornbread after. Well, that sounds like an amazing um, way to wrap things up. I hope you have a great cornbread baking session. And thank you so much for chatting with me. It was an absolute delight. I oh, Thank you. Uh, you're thank amazing. You. Oh, you're an amazing host. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So thank you uh, to the Ottawa Public Library and to the Ottawa International Writers Festival for getting this all together. Um, it is recorded and you'll be able to catch it on the Ottawa Public Library's Facebook page after the event. Um, it will also appear on their YouTube in a couple of weeks with uh, captions. Sorry to the person who has to write those out. <laughs> Intense laughter. 
<laughs> be like <laughs> maybe I should yeah. send the spellings for some things <laughs> <laughs> oh, <amazing. laughs> do, do, do.